Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final installment of the Business School Professional Lecture Series. Um, it's been an absolute br uh, brilliant joy to work with colleagues from the LSBU Business School on this on this lecture series. Um, this is our eighth lecture, which was, was run in two installments, and it's our final one of the year. Um, a very timely lecture, um, working remote working and leading beyond COVID-19 with Professor Karen Moser, who I'll hand over to shortly. Um, before we start, um, I'd just like to read a webinar respect and dignity statement um, to you all. Everyone speaking at or attending an LSBU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSBU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing, learning, celebrating and bringing communities together. LSBU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, discrimination or harassment. Inappropriate behaviour, including behaviour that potentially impacts or contradicts LSBU's reputation and values, will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any of this behaviour will also be removed from the webinar. We want our events to be an enjoyable and warm experience for all. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Um, so just to take you through, uh, we're in Zoom Pro. Um, we are recording this event. So if you don't wish to feature, please do ensure your camera remains off. But what we would like to encourage you to do when it comes to Q&A time after the lecture is for, every, is for if you'd like to ask a question is to turn your cameras and microphone on. We'd really like to get some kind of like nice, um, engaging, interactive chat going. Um, we really, really have, we've been really successful in breaking down the virtual wall and kind of carrying on that spirit of community and networking. So if you're not comfortable, please do pop your questions in the chat box. Um, but if you can do, please turn your cameras and microphones on to join in. Um, please do use the chat box to share your thoughts and comments throughout the throughout the lecture. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to today's guest speaker, Professor Karen Moser. I need to unmute. Thank you. And a big welcome from myself as well. I'm very pleased uh, that you're able to join me today. Um, so I'll go and start sharing my screen with you and I'll go into presentation mode. And I hope you can all see my screen now. Is that all right? We can. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Thanks a lot for that. Yeah. Um, we're coming out of lockdown, full lockdown, lockdown two today in the UK. And uh, obviously, when I agreed to give this lecture, I didn't know it was going to be this timely. Um, uh, but actually, it matters far beyond uh, the pandemic. And obviously, it's not over yet. So remote working and leading has become a reality for the majority of us. And it's probably likely uh, to stay for some time. Um, I've been doing research in this area for a long time, so actually, uh, regardless of the pandemic and the situation we currently all find ourselves in. Um, but um, I want to, um, you know, share with you today um, what are key differences between face-to-face -face working and remote working and leading. So why does it matter? Why do we need to know about it? Uh, how can it help us um, to stay well, to, to stay healthy and uh, to stay productive? So I'll focus on that and then also on some tips on some looks at lookouts into the future um, and the take home message. And then we'll have uh, the Q&A. So why does it matter um, whether we do it and why can't we just transfer what we've been doing face to face in the office? Um, and you know, use the same strategies. Because research shows that our perceptions change. Um, when we go online, our whole information processing changes. So we actually value, evaluate, and respond to the same piece of information in a different way once we shift to online um, media, digital media. And also the ways we can influence others, how we can communicate with others changes. So if we want to stay healthy, productive and effective, we also need to adapt our behaviours um, if we are in remote working in a digital office and collaboration. What are the key differences between how we see ourselves? So it goes both ways, ourselves, but also others 
virtually. One of the core differences is that we have far, far less context than we normally would have. You lose all those little opportunities of informal contact. So coming into the office, meeting somebody in the hallway, um, you know, in the lift up um, to your office, uh, when you go out in meetings at the end, beginning um, of meetings, where you hear about their day, you can see them, you get an impression how well they are, how stressed they are, and so forth. We have far, far less of those opportunities virtually, even if we have um, virtual coffee breaks and, and things like that, and we try to compensate, which is all good. But on the whole, it's still far less. The thing is that if we are face to face, we don't even notice that we do those things. It just happens. And while we do them, we take on board a lot of information that matters, how we perceive our co um, co-workers, but also how we coordinate our work. So another point is that if we go virtual, we have much more asynchronous working because uh, we meet less, and we don't do that unconscious, unintentional coordination things because we can see somebody is on the phone, actually, physically. We don't know when we interrupt them if they're all sitting at home in their remote offices. Um, we also work more text-based and we talk less. So we again lose a lot of coordination just by the fact that we use different media and are all physically in different spaces. On the whole, we also have far, far less opportunities for feedback. You know, checking back in, seeing how, how does a message, how is it taken up, um, how does it arrive, uh, and so forth. Um, and this is not least because we also have far less nonverbal and paraverbal communication. It's almost impossible to, to catch somebody's eye, um, even in a video conference. Um, we cannot really read body language in the same way we can in face-to-face -face meetings um, because even if we have a video call, you can only see the head and the head and the image is still two-dimensional and you can't see the whole body. You can't sense people in the same way. And so that makes uh, a big difference. This has some really significant impacts on our perceptions and behavior uh, one of the, the core differences is that in a digital world, we tend to underestimate the effect of our own actions, how something comes across. Um, if we have a statement, if we put it in a chat, like now in this uh, video conference, or if we put it in an email, uh, the absolutely same thing, the same statement um, can come across very differently. If you can say it in person and you say it with a smile, or even in a phone call, if there is the tone of voice uh, that tells you um, how this is done as compared, compared, it's only in writing or uh, it comes in a virtual meeting, which, and I'll come to that, is also much more controlled in many ways. All of these um, components, they also tend to lead to higher emotionality. Um, and you may have experienced this, people can get very emotional over emails, for example. It has to do with this loss of context, not seeing others, not sensing others, and missing those little opportunities for coordination. Uh, this is really nicely sum up, summed up with this sentence, people type tougher than they talk. And this is a picture um, that I took some years ago in the London Tube. Uh, I'm sure many of you will recognize this. And it's actually an advert in the tube some years ago where a company was advertising um, their conference call um, software um, to people um, uh, using the London tube. And they allure exactly to that fact, that difference between online and offline behavior. I don't know if you can see it here. Let's take this outside of the inbox. It says here, because people type tougher than they talk. Um, because a lot of things you would never say face to face in a physical meeting in the same way as you may if it's digital. Why? Why does this happen? And uh, how can research explain this? And why do we sometimes feel overwhelmed or, you know, almost despair? Uh, 
there is a big cognitive impact on our information processing. And one of the key areas is that um, digital media and being in a remote workspace tends to lead to so-called de-individuation. It means that because we have that loss of context and feedback and individuating social cues about others, that also comes by body language and similar things, um, we sort of see them slightly less as a tendency as individuals in their own right, which also means that stereotypical perceptions and attributes of, of, of our co-workers and our workspace, they come more to the forefront. So it may be that we perceive that this person in this picture here is black, uh, is much more prominent than it would be if we actually spoke to the same person face to face, to face uh, or that somebody's position, somebody's gender, uh, the fact that they're from the IT team, for instance, is much more prominent than it normally would, because if you actually see the person in their full, you know, presence and appearance physically, their individuality is, is at the forefront. Uh, but if you have less context and you see them very little, um, this sort of goes to the back. And that has quite significant impacts, but usually we're not conscious of those. And this is one of the difficulties of managing virtual work in a good and healthy way for all of us. If you're interested in this, want to read up on this, Russell Spears and colleagues, they started this research, and have theorized about this. Um, this is uh, a paper I wrote, actually a practitioner paper that sums up the state of the art and area, this area of research, if you want to more, go more in depth. The other thing that changes is that if we work remotely um, and use digital media to work together and connect, this poses much higher demands on emotion regulation. Emotion regulation is self-control, essentially. It means that you, the ability um, to moderate your reactions and it's, you know, we all know this, it's one of the main things we try to, to teach our, um, somebody has their microphone on, if you could, thank you. Uh, we try to teach um, our children, so a lot of socialization is actually about uh, learning how to regulate your emotions in a socially, socially culturally acceptable way. Um, yeah, and if we are in a digital space, this increases. Um, it's more difficult. Uh, it's also reflected in the fact that because we are more in isolation, we have less control, we meet others less, there is often less social inhibition. Uh, it can happen that you know, people are less polite. It's very known to happen in emails, for instance, or any other written digital communication. Um, and this has to do with all those, the individuation effects, it has to do with having less control over what others do because you can't observe them, but also you have less uh, possibility to directly influence them. Physical presence is actually one of the major uh, ways we can influence others, and you know this, if you really want something from somebody, you try to do it face to face. It's also much harder to say no to someone face to face. It's quite easy to do this um, uh, if you can do it in writing, in an email or similar, but also we are much more isolated. So we also miss those little checks, check-in uh, opportunities, informal ones with others um, that also help us to put our own reactions into context and sort of mitigate things. Um, so it's a combination of all this. If you want to dig into this and are interested in this, some classics on social influence and virtual work, you can see here. Also recent research I have done uh, in this area with some colleagues. So those are um, the core differences. Let's not forget that um, working from home is highly ambiguous. It has also lots of opportunities. And this is one of the reasons why actually, although nobody uh, obviously wants to be in this position we are in with the pandemic currently, um, also appreciates the opportunities of working from home, but there are almost equally as many challenges. If we look to the opportunities, what do we know? Research shows that actually very often, uh, if we work remotely, the meetings are more efficient. 
why they are more focused. You have fewer of them um, with many people uh, in terms of formal meetings. Um, and so you prepare better, yeah? You need to raise your digital hand to actually, um, you know, say something. You need to put it in writing in the chat. You need to demand speaking time in a way that you don't necessarily have to in face-to-face -face meetings. And so research shows that often those meetings are more effective. Many are also more effective because they're less disrupted by co-workers. So disruption by co-workers is actually one of the, the key um, um, drivers that um, puts a barrier on our efficiency. And there's a lot of those uh, co-workers who, you know, um, disrupt your, you while you're doing something else, but also maybe behave in a way in the shared office that distracts you. Mm -hmm. um, then many of us also experience more work autonomy. You're less observed. It's easier to take breaks when you would like it. You, it's maybe a bit easier to, you know, um, uh, structure your day in a way you would like it and so forth. Um, and then for many, it also is an opportunity for more time with family, with friends, uh, for, for leisure, because you're not stuck in a commute. Um, you're actually, you know, at home or you can pick the kids up uh, from school or you're at home when they come home or you have time to, to have a catch up before dinner with your partner or your flatmates uh, and similar, um, uh, which may be difficult if you have to commute um, into the office or you have time to do some sports, um, go for a run, go for a walk and all those things. You can also theoretically at least, work from anywhere. So, you know, that nice picture, taking the office chair to the beach um, and so on. So you have less dependency on location. It matters less where you live. And obviously you gain the time. Um, and, um, and also, you know, the, the tiring aspects of the commute. Equally, there's uh, plenty of challenges because the disruptions often, unless you live alone, don't go away now be your partners, kids, flatmates, um, but also pets. We've all gotten used to small kids disrupting online meetings, work meetings, or dogs barking into um, our meetings. Um, it's also for many much harder to disengage from work uh, because we are in the same space uh, for all the time or most of the time. So there is an even greater you know, challenge of, of not letting the lines blur between private life and work life. Um, then of course, equipment and space is, is an issue. Um, many don't have the luxury of dedicated workspace as in you know, an actual separate room for a home office. Uh, you may not have the same level of equipment um, in terms of a big screen or an ergonomic keyboard or office chair and so on. And while this didn't matter when you just, you know, worked from home occasionally, now we do it permanently and all the time and full time. Obviously, this matters. Um, never changing location space is difficult or makes it more difficult to detach and log off. And there can be considerably more social isolation. That depends, obviously, um, also on you know what your home setup is and um, um, with whom you live or not. Uh, and also, you don't have that office chat. And again, the, the virtual coffee breaks they don't fully replace or similar you know social uh, online meetings. Um, that informal chat gossip, which is the social glue. Um, of the workplace. Um, so it's very ambiguous and uh, there's a challenge not to take the office to the beach as well when working from home if you're at the beach to just you know relax for some private um, time. There's also research and we've done some of this in the first uh, lockdown in the UK uh, about how specific digital media differentiate between you know how tired they make you, how challenging they are, and what they are actually the most, um, the best used for, the most um, appropriate. And I've given lots of interviews recently, um, and there has been quite a lot of press attention to this, and they sort of called it Zoom fatigue, which is not a research technical term, but we all know what it means, right? Um, 
And what did we find? Uh, we differentially in a diary study, and it's cited down here if you're interested in more details, um, looked at is uh, in a diary study with full-time employees working remotely in the UK, um, how they use different medias and how it impacted on their tiredness, need for recovery, uh, depletion and so forth. And we found that video conferencing, for example, Zoom um, uh, causes more depletion uh, compared to just uh, the good old phone calls, but also text-based media like email, chats, direct messaging, um, and so forth. Why is that? Because looking at Zoom screens like you do now and following um, people talking at, in Zoom, especially in interactive meetings when you need to, to uh, listen to different people, um, is much more difficult on screen than it is face-to-face -face because you cannot read the facial expressions, the nonverbal signals as easily as you can um, face to face. There is also the etiquette, which, you know, in technical terms makes a lot of sense of going off camera, but it also creates very odd in between spaces of having people listening to you that you don't see. This could never happen in a physical meeting. You can catch somebody's eye. You see people, you know, avoiding your eye. You can see whether they are writing something or on their phones. Um, you, you can see their facial expressions much, much better, which finds us in an online meeting constantly trying to, to achieve this same clarity um, of reading, reading the cues, knowing where we are at. Uh, and it's more demanding and it makes us much, much more tired. Also having this simultaneous thing of people putting things in the chat. Um, which is actually different channels at the same time. It's actually too much for us. Yeah, it's cognitive overload. Um, and that tires us as well. And then one last point is that we see ourselves on camera normally um, when we speak, not just the others. Um, and quite a few people find this stressful. It actually, we know from research, it increases self-monitoring, it's called in psychology, which is... Um, um, about um, controlling your actions, being self-conscious, how you look, how you sound, um, uh, what you do. Um, and again, it uses cognitive capacity. So yes, it matters. Um, and so uh, we should actually think about when we use which type of digital media. Another last point in research on uh, all this I would like to make is that we also found in our own research, but plenty of other research as well, that not all things are equal. There are quite important um, implications, socioeconomic and implications for inequalities, um, and different things matter. Uh, what we specifically found in our own research is that how well you do with all these challenges and opportunities and how much you're able to, to use the opportunities and be less impacted by the challenges uh, depends on your so-called digital literacy. That is how competent and experienced you are in using the different digital media. So that's an aspect of competence. Uh, then it matters whether you're able to have separated, dedicated space and actually good standard uh, equipment for your work. So the big screens and similar stuff. And this, of course, um, you know, depends on how big your house is and what your home setup is. So what we now have in remote working is suddenly that things that don't matter in the office. So the office, the on-site office is an equalizer in that sense because you're hired for your competence. And whether you just have one room in a flat chair or a big house with a garden doesn't matter in the same way it does now. Now it suddenly does. So it comes back um, and uh, it creates um, a degree of inequality. Uh, also, if you have previous experience with remote working, um, you have an advantage. You're better able to, uh, you know, to re-app uh, the opportunities uh, because most of the people who already have done this in the past before the pandemic hit, they probably also have a better setup um, uh, in their home office. And then lastly, um, if you don't have caring 
or less caring responsibilities for, you know, uh, children or elderly relatives or people with disabilities or whatever, um, then um, you're also better able to re-up the opportunities. Um, this also means that, uh, of course, uh, remote working is, you know, um, advantaging people in white collar jobs, but also those with more socioeconomic uh, resources. So let's not forget um, about this. So knowing all this, uh, that's sort of the most important aspects of the research I wanted to present. Uh, where do we go from here? What, would, what do we do with all of this? And of course, I would love to have a crystal ball. I don't, I'm just a simple scientist. Um, I do have some research, um, but the question is, of course, will our world continue to be turned upside down? We do have some data so we can make some estimates. Um, current estimates say for the UK, but also for many other countries, that probably over 50% of employees uh, will continue to work remotely, even you know, post-pandemic, post-lockdowns, uh, even the tiered system we now from today move into again in, in, in um, England and um, we're in, in the UK. Um, and uh, it also means that a lot of people who previously haven't worked remotely or maybe just the one day a week or occasionally will continue to work remotely to a large degree. The highest likelihood is that we many will move to hybrid models of, um, you know, as the new normal of uh, working. Obviously, there's jobs that can never be remote. We know all that. So waste collection, you can never do remotely. You can never be a remote bus driver and so on. So it's it's mostly the desk jobs and white collar jobs, obviously. Um, but probably the large majority will partly work remotely, partly coming to the office. Um, but probably even those who previously worked remotely, it will sort of like swap, you know, switch the relation. So if you had one day working from home before pandemic and all this, uh, it might now be one day in the office and four days from home. Um, and so this has really big implications. It means that there is a shift and probably a longer term or permanent shift from office spaces. And often those are urban central, uh, centrally located office spaces to the home office and co-working spaces um, in suburban and rural areas. I think actually this will be a big increase uh, because the co-working spaces, there's sort of an intermediary. Also, if you have little space at home, not to work in isolation, having dedicated space, uh, but not having to commute because it's more local. Um, so these are likely to flourish. Other uh, longer term consequences, it has lots of economic uh, consequences and about cost, costs because essentially the need for equipment now shifts to the home office or the remote office from the centralized office. So we need new models to resolve this. Um, we need to rethink the central office um, workspaces because if people, the majority of employees only come in one or two days a week, it completely changes its purpose in the sense of that it's mainly for meetings rather than actually doing the job on your own. Um, it's for checking in, it's for social events and so forth. It also has implications for leadership. Uh, we need a distributed leadership in a digital world. Um, for media adequate digital collaboration. So we need to uh, become better at using the right medium. So video conferencing and uh, emails and chats and you know, online repositories and intranet for the right things. And we need a way to mitigate the potential and actual social and economic inequalities. So if this is what the future brings, what can we do? Uh, obviously, some of the things I just mentioned, they're really longer term, but I think there are a few things that you can do, and actually you can do, um, both as employees and as business owners or leaders today or starting tomorrow, and I would like to outline just a few of those. So the first set of things you can do for yourself, and I've chosen this picture of somebody, you know, taking care of their brain 
because a lot of this is cognitive impact. Yeah, things that happen in our perceptions and information processing. And so we need to support to do this in the best um, possible way. How can you do this? One of the crucial things is proper detachment. It's one of the healthiest things you can do for yourself. Effective, healthy employees are able, and you know, people who work are able to properly detach, to come back, to recover, to come back refreshed to work. Uh, if you're longer term or forever, possibly stuck in the home office or in remote working, this means doing things, especially now when we are still in part lockdown uh, with the pandemic, try to simulate that physical commute, for instance, in some way, because as tiring as it is, it helps exactly with that healthy detachment because it's you know, it's a physical replacement, it's space between work and private life. Uh, it, it makes a clear break. Um, you could try to do this by, you know, doing the same amount of minutes on your exercise bike. If you have one at home, if you don't, you could do the same amount of, of, of minutes and take a walk at the start and end of your day. And then when you uh, come back, you sit at your desk you do nothing else just like you would in the real uh, office. Um, other things to mark the end and start of work uh, physically by moving, moving the room, even if you just move from one part of a table, if you have to work on your kitchen table um, to the other. So one corner is work and other, another corner is, is for eating. It sounds maybe stupid, it's not. It will help your brain to make that detachment. Um, also, if you have the opportunity to have dedicated phones or laptops just for work and different devices, if you want to watch a film later uh, and so on, for your private email, all of that helps. Time management, um, take regular breaks. Actually, that's good advice anyway. Yeah, and <laughs> will help you to be healthy and productive also in on-site work. But because it's more tiring um, to do it digitally, it's even more important now. Um, it should be 15 minutes every two hours. That's the healthy way to do it. Really break, go away, um, do some exercises, don't be on the screen, take a mini walk, or just go, you know, I don't know, stand in front of your house, have a chat over the fence with your neighbor, talk to your cat, uh, just something, um, yeah. Don't work after hours unless it's really agreed with your supervisor, your team, because you're on call, you're paid, it's part of your explicit work. Always important, now more than ever, and shut down the work devices, the work programs completely. Put them away if you can, also over lunch. Uh, it takes discipline, and in the home office even more, but it will improve your um, um, well-being uh, a lot. Boundary management also on the private side. Uh, so try to at least once a day to screen, uh, to schedule off screen uh, activities, social, physical, with your family, uh, something. Um, uh, if you don't live with other people, at least physical activities or maybe have that chat with a neighbor. Uh, and also make those explicit agreements about boundaries with your family as much as you can or the people you live with, your flatmates. When can you be disturbed? When are you ready for that after work chat, catch up, drink or lunch uh, and so forth? What about leading? What can you do today uh, if you no longer can bring people together and unite them and motivate them like here where they put their hands together and everybody's only on their um, devices? Uh, it's quite challenging. It's not easy to be a remote leader because you can't use other ways of influencing that you might be more used to in, in on-site leadership because you have no physical presence. You cannot you know, uh, actually see what people do. And so leading by demands and controlling people is much more difficult and you have to lead more by persuasion, participation, bringing people together, uh, involving them and trusting them to get on and do their job. Um, Autonomy is one of the benefits of, of remote working, more autonomy. And so try to adapt your leadership and re those benefits. So 
This means if you have the opportunity to give some people in your organization, in your team, a bit more autonomy in how they do things, now's the time to go for it. Um, you also need to have, um, you know, establish goals, lead more by objectives, um, via establishing a joint identity. What are we about? What is the joint goal that we try to achieve? And do this with your team rather than setting it for your team. Um, and uh, one important way to do this, and also to develop this, is to have regular feedback. Uh, and not only give it, it should be all around, but also seek it. That is actually a really uh, important part of this. Um, and, you know, seek it in, a, in, a, in an honest, open way, or as open uh, as, poss as you possibly um, um, can, because this is a new situation for everybody. Nobody expects everyone to get it right at first. Um, but getting this feedback and working it into how you continue working will help doing this, and it'll help doing it jointly. Um, to have this, you know, healthy digital culture, uh, leading by example is more important than ever. It's always important. Uh, most of those things are just general good leadership stuff. Um, so um, really uh, reflect on your own use of digital media before you call meetings and put people into Zoom meetings or video conferencing, your own working hours and so on. Uh, do what you preach. It's not going to work if you say one thing and do another. Um, the explicit agreements, if you are the boss, if you have some leadership responsibility, you can do a lot there. Be as explicit as possible about expectations for availability, breaks and so on. Don't forget those who may need extra support because they have additional uh, responsibilities or possibly existing health issues. And then last but not least, don't forget, um, you know, the, the physical stuff that you can help with. Uh, so if you if you have the funds, the possibility to provide better work devices, mobile devices, maybe also some training for adequate digital media use, that will help. So take home message. Uh, what do I think is the most important things I would like you to take away from today, hopefully, so you then don't end up cross-eyed looking at the screen like this guy here in this lovely picture. Um, I think, like so often, it starts with awareness. So uh, what does technology do with us? Uh, and what are the challenges and opportunities? So uh, we discussed this today. Um, knowledge about those differences I talked about, that we know from research, uh, I think that is a starting point. It helps. Um, so providing this more widely in your organization should help. And then you can do simple things. Take that minute or two before you schedule your next meeting or write your next email. Are you using the right digital tool? Is this really the best way to communicate a task? And then, you know, the little stuff that you uh, have control over, the mini breaks, the no work after hours, the very consequently going offline, the being explicit, it's one of the additional burdens of a digital world. We need to be more explicit because we can regulate less informally. Yeah. And so this is something that if everybody does this a bit more, both leaders and employees, um, it'll make life easier. And the last point I would like to make, don't take it personally. Um, so if you were wondering why you were so tired, uh, sometimes so demotivated, um, a large chunk of this is the effect of remote working and also for digital work environment. It affects us all. Don't make it personal. Thank you uh, for your attention. And I'm very happy to take questions and comments now. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Kareen, for um, a really insightful lecture. Um, but also, I think not only was you like lots of practice, lots of practical takeaways, but also really reassuring um, in terms of kind of like, you know, this is the first time many of us are doing this. Um, and um, I've been feeling really, really like shattered lately and kind of just thinking like, oh, you know, why? And actually, it's because this is a whole new thing. It's really reassuring. Yeah. It's really, really reassuring to hear some of what you said. Um, Sanchia, you have a question. Would you like to come online and ask? Yeah, come on camera as well, if you feel like it, please. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really good to hear about this research happening right here at LSBU. So I guess the first thing is how do we make sure that everybody here knows about it because it's really excellent. Um, but no, I, I like your, um, you know, how you kind of come up with the recommendations and stuff because I'm somebody here that um, sort of did my recruitment and completely started virtually. So I've never visited the campus. And I saw, we would have all seen the email from Dave Phoenix that obviously we're expected to work from home, obviously with some caveats until July next year. So I kind of wonder about the long-term impact of that is, is, you know, I try not to think about it too much, but I kind of think what would it have been like for me starting the job like pre-COVID to now and my interaction with my colleagues and my relationships and how those would have developed. Because I've also started another one, I'm a trustee of a charity in Baldy completely in June, virtually then. And what I've noticed is that we can get the work done and we do the work to a very high standard, but you get to know people individually less because you're kind of just focused on the work. Yes. And yep. you to know other things about them and what makes yep. them is 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 difficult so yeah it's it's inevitable because and you you we also we are you know we are more task fo focused which can make us more efficient uh but it's much much harder to establish trust and to establish person personal relations and uh yeah we tend to see people more as a function of their roles because of that the individuation um, and so this is, yeah, there's no way around it. It's a fact of life. Um, so essentially, the answer is that um, as soon as it's safe again and we can, you always should, even with the workforce, you know, continuing to work remotely, schedule some physical meetings, very targeted ones, where you bring people into uh, the office on site exactly for those reasons. Um, we're never going to, you know, be able to compensate fully for that. Um, humans are social beings. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. There's more questions, I think. I hope you help me with this, Neil. <laughs> so that will do. Um, oh, Mike. Mike has a question. She's, he's just coming on live. You're on mute, Mike. Thanks, Karen. Uh, a great lecture. Bitter we didn't have it six months ago, really, in some way. <laughs> Um, well, what can I say? Yes. Um. What, what, I, what I'm interested in is the fact that most of our students, particularly doing dissertations, capstones, are collecting data at the moment through remote interviews. And really, I, I've got two questions in relation to that. I mean, does the research available give us any pointers about the quality of data that people collect through remote interviews compared with face-to-face? -face. And secondly, are, are there any short words of advice we can give to students going into a remote interviewing situation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, actually, I think for research, it's very different from work relations because obviously it's, it's just a one-time thing. And it's not an ongoing relationship longer time, lo longer term, like it would have in the work team. Um, so I think it also has an advantage uh, because it means that if you do it remotely, things like likability um, of, of the other person actually plays less of a role. And it's more a function of what, you know, their role, they are the interviewers and they are the others are the interviewees. So there's actually uh, a lot of advantages. Equally, if it should, especially if it should be um, sensitive topics um, that the interviews are about that are personal, then of course you have the problem of slightly less trust because it's just different if you see somebody. Uh, it, it can go both ways. So if you like the person you see in person and you have a positive sense and you like them, then actually this will increase trust. Um, but if you don't like them equally, it'll actually do more damage than if you do it remotely, because remotely you are exactly that. You are more removed in your, you know, as a person and less suitable. Um, so there's no evidence to my knowledge that it can seriously damage the, the ability to collect data. But I think those two points, it's important to make the students aware of. Um, 
And I think what is always the case also is this kind of data collection, just like for any work we do remotely, is you need to be even more explicit about the purpose of what you try to achieve. So instructions beforehand, before they go into interviews, uh, would be to be as clear as possible, even, even more so than if they can do it in person. That would be my recommendation. Yeah. I, th I think the point on detachment also applies because the worst thing would be going to interview somebody on the back of two hours of Zoom meetings. I mean, you need to yep. take that detachment out, both the respondent and the interviewer, take yep. that detached period out beforehand. Yep, yep. So, um, I mean, you can advise the interviewees that this would be advisable to have a little break, and certainly for the people who interview, because it will impact negatively on the quality otherwise. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Valerio, or I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I have a question. Um, um, well, great lecture. Thanks, Karin. Um, the, what I was thinking, I mean, forward looking about this, the, the new experience that we had, <clears throat> we are forced to, to have during these days is uh, in the future, I mean, would it, would it be possible to embed, to incorporate into the business cultures, I mean, for academics even more so into universities cultures, to have, you know, as a benefit or as a different working experience, like the possibility to have six months of remote working for make yourself being able to, you know, engage probably with co-authors or work in another place. I mean, sticking with the rule about fiscal policy that a, that a country have with respect to others, for example, I could spend three or six months somewhere where it is allowed from a, from a perspective of the fiscal of uh, the fiscal aspects of it, even shorter terms, one month working somewhere else and and keep going with what I have. I mean, once all this passed, right, it, it could be it could be a great possibility for those who want to 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 get the chance to work for somewhere else yeah. rather than yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think this opens up a lot of possibilities in that area. Uh, I'm very sure that all the employers will also need to consider um, things like insurance and, you know, health, health and safety issues um, if they, they permit those things. Um, so that's part of the new economic and, and business models that we need and that need to, to adapt. But I'm sure those problems are solvable. And uh, if this is more part of the standard work culture, of course, this opens up all those possibilities for jobs like, for example, academic jobs, where this might actually be a big benefit. Yeah. Okay. I, I think we need to we need more research on the other sides of the you know economic and and business model sides of things as well, um, uh, and employer you know employer employee relations and things like that HR issues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah? Is... Yes, I have a question. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that, and I agree that um, we are working longer hours now, uh, working from home, you know, working remotely. Um, so I'm thinking that this would also be a potential, um, you know, concern or an issue that how do you um, you know, calculate um, the working hours? How do you measure job performance or, or know the working or how to uh, assess the workload of, you know, different employees? Or if we're working from home, you know, two or three months, as just um, Valerio said, and working on campus, you know, a few months, how would one know, you know, or be able to assess our workloads? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think actually this has to change. It's very... Um, crucial, you're absolutely right, and I think there's uh, fewer fewer opportunities um, to control in a physical sense and see actually this person spent you know seven or eight hours at their desk and uh, and uh, at the end of that they delivered X Y. Um, there's no other choice but to leave uh, to to move to a model that is more management by objectives. So you set goals and tasks that need doing and um, it's less important how long it takes somebody. So, um, you know, inevitably, if somebody is more efficient for whatever reason, uh, but they deliver the quality, um, 
they, you know, that is required and they get the job done and that's it, it's done. Um, but it, it requires a different thinking, um, mm -hmm. especially for organizations and leaders who are used to employ a model that very much relies on, on actually also controlling the exact hours. Um, and so you, you need to do it by tasks and let's uh, talk about the hours it needs to get it done. Uh, but, you know, equivalence of tasks and jobs. Um, and um, yeah, and then of course there may be issues of fairness, um, but if somebody takes considerably longer for the same task and to achieve the same quality, the question is why? Um, and then they probably need some support either or you have hired the wrong person for the job. <laughs> I mean, that's quite, yeah. So um, I think in a way, you know, it, um, yeah, but it, it poses a number, a number of new challenges for leaders. And I think that if you're less experienced in leading, uh, it, it'll be even more challenging. Definitely, thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, thank you. Yeah, okay, anybody else? Anybody in the chat? I've just put a call out to see if there's any other ones, um, but um, just we'll go to one in the chat. Um, Adnan says, how do you develop a connection with an organisation if you start virtually? And Sanchia, I know that you'd spoken about this. What's your thoughts on that, Karen? Yeah, OK. Um, you should definitely have social um, meetings and calls. I very much recommend to have one on one video calls with the key people you start working with. Uh, because uh, although we still have the reduction of social cues, uh, in a one-to-one -on -one video call, you can pick up the social nuances and facial expressions much better than in a larger meeting. Um, the other thing is, is the, the, the aspect of uh, being very explicit. So one of the ways you can establish trust um, also in, in completely virtual relationships where you have never met the other people is by being extremely reliable, showing reliability uh, and extremely almost over explicit confirmation of every step of the way because you need this, otherwise things sort of disappear in a black hole and you don't know what is happening, uh, which actually puts a much higher burden on communication. So communi in any virtual digital work, communication is a, is a core part of the job and it takes up a larger portion. Um, that's the way to do it. There, there's research looking at this. And if you do this reliably, it, it actually goes down to confirm receipt for every single email um, and say, yes, I've got it. I've taken it on board on both sides. And this is the timeline for doing X, Y. Um, all of those things matter much less if you know somebody already and you trust them because you've worked with them for years. So the colleagues we know well and we've worked on site for years, um, there is much more leeway in that relationship if it then has to move to, to, to remote working um, relationships. If you don't have that, that's the way to go. Does that answer your question, Anand? I think yeah, I'm pretty sure it, it, it does and it definitely kind of like... Um... Again, lots of practical takeaways for how to actually put these into action. Um, just we've got time for one last question. Sue says, speaking of leadership and management, do you have any tips for managing performance or inducting new members of staff? Yeah, um, I think the performance issue is, is very much the same as I already responded to the question by Sarah Sabagan. Uh, it needs to be more by objectives. Uh, I fully recognize that for leaders who are used to lead in a different way, this may feel very unsafe and insecure. Um, I don't think you have a choice. Uh, you may also want to consider help and support, coaching support, training to start leading more in that way. Um, I think there's no, no um, other way. Um, equally for managing performance, you need to, to, to much more move to checking the bottom line, what has been achieved, has been achieved, what I, you know, asked for, has the task been completed? Has it been completed to in time and in the quality that is required? Um, and uh, if not, you do need to have those uh, follow-up meetings, one-to-ones with your staff um, to try to find out what may be required. Um, don't forget that whatever the private lives are for staff now start mattering more again. 
we didn't have to talk about this, but you know how much how adequate their workspace is at home may actually impact on their ability to 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 perform. And so don't forget that it's not an excuse, but it's an additional aspect that you now actually will need to have to take on board to some degree. And maybe you can also help out with those, um, you know, physical conditions um, of, of the, the remote workspace. Thank you. Um, and just one final question in that case. Uh, Pam asked, would the research explore the impact on different age groups? Um, we didn't find in our research, uh, none of the research actually I did so far on digital media, not just the COVID-19 uh, lockdown research on, you know, different media and well-being. We never found any age differences. It's something we always check, of course. Um, I think what matters much more is experience, uh, home office setup, digital literacy, um, things like that. Um, so socioeconomic factors, but actually age, um, I think a lot of, you know, it's quite popular in the media to talk about that digital divide and sort of the digital natives. So the young ones, they all, you know, they sort of, they suck it up growing up and uh, they know no different and the oldies, they have difficulties. But actually research doesn't really confirm this in this um, clarity. Of course, this can happen. But there's actually lots and lots of older people um, for whom this is a huge advantage and they take to the digital world like this, because uh, especially if you're, you know, not as mobile anymore, actually that offers you a world of experience and opportunity to participate that you wouldn't have otherwise anymore. Um, so actually age is less of a divider, uh, but social, uh, economic background, uh, yes, gender, as far as housework and caring responsibilities is um, concerned very much. So it puts women under pressure to more um, traditional role divisions again. Thank you. We have run out of time for questions, so we'll round up now. Um, thank you for sharing your research, your expertise and your knowledge, but for also um, presenting a really engaging, well-balanced and holistic approach to to it all um, it's been laced with practical takeaways reassurance and um i i think i'll speak on behalf of the audience when um, i say i really enjoyed it and i think there's a lot to take from it and caroline you're nodding in agreement <laughs> and um yeah thank you um it's been brilliant. Thanks, Karen. Really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in to our Business School Professional Lecture Series um, since we first went into lockdown in April. Um, in the in the uh, participant box, there's lots of familiar names and lots of new names. Um, you know, hopefully when things are back to normal, we'll hope we'll 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 be able to host these on campus. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much for all of you for joining, and thanks, Karen, for today. Thank you very much from my side as well. Visit the Moser Lab if you want more information. Uh, it was a pleasure. Stay healthy, stay safe and productive. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone. We will leave the chat box going just for a couple of minutes, just so that people yep. can say their thank yous. Um, but thanks, everyone.